I think Her Interactive wanted to try something big and exciting to celebrate Nancy's 25th game. I think they succeeded on that front. Even the naysayers who dislike this game agree it's better than the other two milestone games, games 20 and 30. The premise is that Nancy's friends have to clear her name when she's falsely accused of arson in River Heights. There are three elements to the premise which shout milestone game. We get to see Nancy's hometown for the first time. Nancy's accused of a crime, which has never happened before. And we get to play as her friends, which has happened before, but we haven't ever played as Ned. Sadly, Ned is the only friend who doesn't appear in person, which is a bummer. If I had to choose between having Ned or Bess and George as in-person characters, I would pick Ned for the novelty factor, because we've never seen him before. The game starts at Nancy's desk, as usual. Her case file is for the local clues challenge. The idea is that different teams are solving puzzles in a race to find a hidden medallion. I'm sure it's a very one-sided competition, because Nancy Drew is on one of the teams. It appears they've already solved three riddles. Instead of a plane ticket, you click on the fourth riddle to start the case. It's an anagram telling Nancy to check the thermostat in the old town hall. It just now occurred to me that the culprit's plan would have been foiled if Nancy had asked one of her team members to go with her to check out this clue. It is kind of rude of her to do it all by herself. There is no I in Team Danger, Nancy. Nancy goes to the old town hall, where she hears a mysterious ticking noise. Zoom in on the thermostat to see an ice cube shaped like a snowflake. It melts, causing the thermostat to explode and catch on fire. Yikes. Who knew ice cubes could be so dangerous? The door is locked. Nancy's thrown into a puzzle where you have to stack boxes and stools and other random objects to reach the glass above the door. This is a good variation of the Renata's bag puzzle from the previous game. When you solve the puzzle, Nancy crawls on the floor beneath the smoke. The puzzle is to find the exit following the escape route that was posted next to the door. You can still solve the puzzle even if you didn't see the escape route. Avoid dead ends and doors with smoke underneath them. Nancy goes outside to find the four suspects standing around. I like how three of these characters are taken directly from the Nancy Drew books. That's another milestone game thing. Brenda Carlton was Nancy's rival in the 1980s and 1990s. Deirdre Shannon was Nancy's rival in the 2000s and 10s. They were both pretty annoying characters, so they weren't great as antagonistic characters here in the game. In fact, I would say they are more memorable in this game than they are in any of the books that they appeared in. Brenda wastes no time in asking leading questions to make Nancy look as guilty as possible. Nancy's dad should sue for slander. Chief McGinnis interrupts and takes Nancy's statement. He asks her some basic questions. I think Chief McGinnis is okay in this game. The voice actor does a great job, and he is working that mustache. Like the cops in other Nancy Drew stories, though, Chief McGinnis is limited by the fact that he's not a very good police officer. Because if he was, then he would solve every mystery on his own without the help of a teenage detective. We get to see the end of Brenda's news report about the fire. Again, Brenda accuses Nancy of committing this terrible crime. She ends by saying, Back to you, Jim. I just read the book with Brenda and the local news station, so I know she should have said, Hal, not Jim. I can't believe they got Channel 9 News right, but the name of the lead anchorman wrong. The game skips to the next day, when Nancy's talking to Bess on the phone. She's interrupted by the doorbell and flashing police lights. Chief McGinnis reluctantly arrests Nancy and reads her her rights. You can hear a confused Bess and a barking dog in the background. That's a nice touch. We see the outside of the police station while we hear Nancy being processed. I wish we got to see her mugshot. They show her mugshot on the title screen from the nose down. I think that should have been included in the game. 
Nancy's put in holding cell number one, which has a phone. Chief McGinnis says, All right, Drew, you get to make a call. The only person she can call is her father, Carson Drew. He's a big shot lawyer. It makes sense that she'd call him first. I think she's lucky she gets to call someone second. Usually on TV, you only get to make one phone call from jail. Nancy tells her dad he doesn't need to freak out and catch the next flight home, which is exactly what he does when he hears she's in jail. When Nancy calls her friends, she tells them to use the clues wiki that's on their phones, and she asks them to find the note which led her to town hall. It doesn't matter if Nancy calls Bess, George, or Ned. The conversation is 90% the same, with the differences being that George brags she made the wiki, and Nancy tells Ned, I knew I could count on you, while she tells Bess and George, you're the best. That's one of the things which kind of bugs me about this game. No matter which character you play as, they're going to do and say the exact same things, word for word. I wish there was more variation to the three characters. Although I understand that it'd probably be a programming nightmare if they were all completely unique. Another complaint is that you can't directly switch from one friend to the other. If you want to switch characters, you have to go back to Nancy first. That is an unnecessary limitation. The friends should be able to call each other and switch leads. I guess they did it so you couldn't switch between two characters who are technically in the same location, but I don't think that's really a problem. Nancy's friends can call each other, but I rarely do that because there's no real point, their conversations are not that interesting. I think the map of River Heights is okay. I would have preferred a more realistic map. This one has over 10 blocks with only one house. There is a detailed version of the map at Scoop, and I'm sure all of these locations are from different Nancy Drew books. The map is not user-friendly. You can't look at the map and immediately know where anything is. You have to move your mouse all over the screen and guess where things are. Maybe they should have highlighted the five important locations you can travel to to make it more obvious these are the important locations. When you click on a spot, you see an animation of a car driving there. That animation is pretty impressive. It must have taken them forever to program this. I'm sure that's why all the streets are so narrow, and why you can only visit a limited number of places on the large map. You can travel to some unimportant locations like George's house or the graveyard. That's nice, but visiting some locations only makes me wish you could visit every location. Nancy's friend goes to the old town hall. The note is clearly visible on the ground in the middle parking space. I don't know how the police and firefighters overlooked it. There are police officers here. If you try to go in through the front door, it's a game over sequence. If you call Nancy back, she tells you to go to the police station and put the note in the package drop so she can get it. After you do that, Chief McGinnis agrees to let Nancy out of her jail cell. As long as she stays in the building, he'll look the other way. That's nice of him, but I'm sure it's gotta be illegal to let the main suspect wander around freely and use police-only equipment. I think the game could have worked if they went the more realistic route and did not give Nancy access to the police station. She could have been limited to only using the phone and the evidence board. Nancy needs to find 15 pieces of evidence and put them in the correct spots in order to get out of jail. The picture of Nancy is clearly a picture of Bess, just covered up with a post-it note. I always thought Deirdre's picture was an old photo of her when she had long curly hair. She looks nice that way. I just now zoomed in on the picture, and no, it's the normal Deirdre. She's standing in front of a flower statue or something, and it's kind of dark, so it looks like her hair. When Nancy goes to Chief McGinnis's door, she overhears him chewing out a rookie cop named Detective Ryan, who lost the evidence locker key at Pancake City. I love how McGinnis tells him to flip Pancake City. He won't let poor job performance get in the way of a good joke. Nancy tells her friends about the key. The friend goes to Pancake City, 
where they're told Detective Ryan went to Mabel Rose's. This character sounds like Tino Balducci, but I think that's just a coincidence. Mabel Rose, whoever she is, said Detective Ryan went to Alexi's antique shop. If you're playing as Bess, she accidentally knocks over a vase. Alexi is so mean about it, Bess decides to avoid him from now on. You have to switch to another character to continue the investigation. I think Alexi's a good character. He's a bitter, sarcastic old man, but I can overlook that because he is funny. He's really tall, and the voice acting is excellent. He's got the most interesting backstory of all the characters in the game. He used to be a famous kid detective, until a political criminal named J.P. Bennington framed him for theft. Alexi's life was utterly ruined, and he's a sad reminder of what will happen to Nancy if she can't clear her good name. Alexi says Detective Ryan left something on the new arrival's shelf. It's a puzzle! You have to press the buttons to get rid of the bars. It's an okay puzzle, it's easy enough to figure out the pattern behind the buttons. Although, I usually hit the buttons at random until I get it right. Solving the puzzle gets you the evidence locker key. The second time you visit Alexi's shop, Brenda Carlton's van appears. Brenda is such a mean and openly corrupt journalist, I think they wanted her to be a character that fans love to hate. I like her outfit. I don't know what is going on with her hair, though. Brenda refuses to help prove Nancy's innocence. Quite the opposite. Brenda's going to make Nancy look guilty, no matter what, because that makes for good TV. Nancy uses the evidence key on Locker 205. It has three drawers. The bottom drawer has a lockpicking kit that Nancy doesn't use, the keys to Nancy's dresser, and her phone. Let me talk about the phone for a bit. Ned's phone is the only one without a camera app. I guess he has an old phone. The different phone backgrounds are all cover art for various games in the series. That's a nice touch. Every phone has a hint hotline that I don't use. Nancy's normal journal is replaced with the phone wiki that all the characters are sharing. Some of the journal entries are fun things. Like, Nancy says Ned should spend his entire fake date talking about her just to annoy Deirdre. The top drawer of the evidence locker has an audio recording of Chief McGinnis questioning the five suspects. You can play it on a desk here. It's interesting, but ultimately pointless. It doesn't help the investigation. The drawer has instructions for the police computer password and the middle drawer. This is a puzzle that I don't quite like. There are five triangles with five dots each. You want to press in the various tabs so you get dots two dots of each color. There are arches at the top which enforce a rule that triangles next to each other can't have the same colored dots. That rule is not obvious just from looking at the puzzle or the arches. I feel like they could have changed the puzzle interface to make the rules more obvious. It feels like one of those puzzles where people will click the tabs randomly until they get the solution instead of bothering to read the rule book and learn what you have to do. Inside the drawer is a folder with information about Nancy's arrest. One page triggers the puzzle of figuring out why the fire alarm was disabled during the fire. Nancy asks one of her friends to go to Town Hall and check it out. Somehow the police there don't notice as the friend moves debris in front of the window to make a ladder. This might have been a good place to reuse the build a ladder out of random objects puzzle that Nancy did earlier. The fire alarm is near the doorway that Nancy used. It's clearly set to deactivated mode. Again, I don't know how the police and firefighters failed to notice this. If you look at the fire alarm at the start of the game, the switch is already in the deactivated position. Although it's hard to see this because you can't zoom in on the alarm then. Nancy's friend tells her the alarm is disabled. Nancy tells her father. He says he'll get an update for her in a few minutes. When you call him back, and waiting for him to... Oh man, that is very annoying. I was like, I have to wait like two minutes in real life? Urgh! Answer my calls right away, Carson. When you call Nancy's dad back, he has confirmed the fire alarm was manually disabled at 2.17pm. 
Nancy tells her friends to get alibis for that time. I got a little distracted complaining about Nancy's father there, so let me recap what just happened. Nancy finds the fire alarm paper. She reports it to her friends, who report their findings to Nancy, who reports that to her dad, then passes his report on to her friends. That's four close-together scenes of characters telling each other things that the player already knows. I think these scenes could have been left out entirely. It would have worked just fine for Nancy to know what her friends found out without being told directly. That's the whole point of them sharing a wiki on their phones, right? Besides, in other games, Nancy's phone friends usually know what's happening without being told. Alexi says he was giving a historical presentation when the alarm was disabled. The newspaper outside his shop says the meeting was cancelled. When you confront Alexi over his false alibi, he gets mad and kicks you out of his shop. I don't remember if there was a follow-up to this. I wonder why he lied about his alibi and what he was really doing. Brenda says she was working. There's no follow-up to this. The evidence board note for her says, Said she was working, can't confirm. I feel like Nancy should be able to confirm this. Brenda works with other people, right? You can find the other two characters at Scoop. Deirdre Shannon is there. Deirdre Shannon is always there. Deirdre is so mean and sarcastic. I love her. I would hate her in real life, and maybe have a crush on her in real life, but she is so entertaining here. I am glad they brought her back in later games. Bess is also at Scoop. She's eating ice cream and spying on Deirdre. It doesn't help the investigation much, but at least she's trying. Bess is hilarious as usual. Bess and Deirdre both look good in this game. I'm surprised they made a whole new Bess character for the game, instead of reusing the Bess model from game 20. Deirdre says she was working on the clues challenge with her friends, Jessica and Holly. You have to call both her friends. One of them says Deirdre was there. The other says she wasn't. If you ask Deirdre, she says her friends are dumb, and she's probably going to get new ones soon. Not with that attitude, she's not. The last suspect is Tony Scolari, a local politician who runs the ice cream shop. Something about her rubs me the wrong way. She's a mixture of smug and pretending to be nice. I don't know who voted for her. I wouldn't vote for her. She cracks mean jokes about Alexi and Nancy, and somehow I find that more insulting than Deirdre and Brenda directly insulting Nancy. Scoop is a nice location. If it wasn't for the owner, I'd like to go there in real life. There are so many great ice creams to choose from, and there's an arcade game called Swap-A-Lot, which has drop quotes puzzles. I think all of the quotations are from former Nancy Drew games. Tony is nicer to you if you're playing as Bess. Bess must be her favorite customer. You have to play as Bess to get Tony's alibi. Tony says she was working at Scoop, but the newspaper at Nancy's house says Scoop was closed. So our heroes use newspapers to disprove two alibis. It's good to know this town has reporters who are more helpful than Brenda. Tony will confess that she lied, because the store is doing so badly, she had to fire all her employees. Maybe she should offer Deirdre a job. Deirdre practically lives there. When you ask Tony about Nancy's arrest, the conversation is interrupted by a delivery truck. Tony leaves, giving you a chance to snoop around. Behind the counter, you find photographs of Town Hall. There's a snowflake ice cube tray, just like the one that started the fire. Tony will say Deirdre's the one who got the ice cubes for her, and she laughs off the idea that this makes her look guilty. Luckily, the police evidence board disagrees. Take the key from the counter and use it to open the back door. This leads to a file cabinet. You have to open it using the lockpicking kit that Nancy had in the police evidence locker. This leads to a problem with the game. All four characters have separate inventories. Juggling inventory items among Nancy and her three friends is a hassle. I wish they could all share an inventory, but no, you have to manually pass things from one character to another using the drop box at the police station. 
the worst is when you forget which character has the one item you need and you're forced to guess who it is because there is no way to check who has what. To avoid that problem, I usually stick to playing as Ned the whole time because he can do everything except ask for Tony's alibi. That is Bess's big contribution to the game. George is the only character who's not needed for a particular event, so I usually skip over her. Sorry, George. The bottom left drawer of Nancy's desk has a book about lockpicking. It's written in a simple code. All the vowels were removed. You use this information to figure out how to pick the lock on Tony's filing cabinet. You have to place the four lockpicks in the correct spots, then click them 11 times in the correct order. To the relief of cheaters everywhere, you can look up the solution on the internet. The game accepts the correct solution, even if you never looked at Nancy's instructions on lock breaking. Alright! The cabinet contains two files. One is about Tony's proposal to replace the old town hall with a new property. The other is an angry message that Nancy Drew must be stopped. Every time Nancy solves a mystery, it makes the police and government look bad, and they often have to spend money to make things better. Tony wants to shut down Nancy's detective work for good. Hey Tony, if you want to avoid bad publicity, maybe you should do your job. Another big puzzle is getting fingerprints. After Deirdre is mean to Bess or George, they can tell Nancy Ned needs to help. Nancy asks Ned to be extra charming for Deirdre. Deirdre is sure to tell Ned everything because she has a big crush on him. I mean, who doesn't? When Ned asks Deirdre about the fire, she confesses she was secretly following Nancy. She also stole a note that the culprit left for Nancy. The note is in a plastic bag to protect it from rain. Nancy says you should fingerprint the note. Nancy's keys from the evidence locker unlock the cabinet in the corner of her bedroom. Inside are three fingerprinting kits, one for each member of Team Danger. That's an okay way of ensuring all three characters can have the same inventory item. I wish they did something similar with the other items in the game. The cabinet also has a bunch of Coco Kringle bars and four boxes of matches. Nancy's friends wonder how the matches ended up at the crime scene. I'm wondering why Nancy has so many matches! You can use Nancy's desk to fingerprint the note, put the brush in the powder, then use it on the note. Use the tape to collect the clearest fingerprint. The computer at the police station has a fingerprint analyzer. Put the fingerprint into the scanner. The computer's locked with a puzzle. You can't select the same number more than once, and there's only one number per row and column. It's an okay puzzle. The computer can't find a fingerprint match, which means Nancy's friends need to get fingerprints from all four suspects. The fingerprint Alexi ask him for a specific item, like a train. He'll leave to go get it for you. Fingerprint his bottle of metal polish. Tony's the easiest to fingerprint. Just buy some ice cream from her and fingerprint the bowl. Somehow she doesn't notice you busting out a fingerprint kit in the middle of her store. Nancy asks Ned to distract Deirdre by taking her out on a date. Everyone seems to find it hilarious that Nancy wants Ned to date other girls, especially after last game's romance drama. It's also funny that Ned asks Deirdre to go get food with him, when the two of them are already at a food place. Deirdre leaves to go get ready giving Ned a chance to fingerprint her drink. The next time Ned talks to Deirdre, she's mad at him. She waited over an hour for him, but he never showed up. Where? Where did she wait for him? They never agreed on where they'd meet. It's totally Deirdre's fault she got stood up because she never told Ned where to go. Deirdre also gets mad when Ned says she's wearing the exact same outfit as before. Nancy needs to have all three fingerprints in her inventory before you can get Brenda's fingerprint. I don't know why. It doesn't make sense that Nancy's friends go out of their way to save Brenda for last, but they do. Ask Brenda for a way to keep in touch with her, and she gives you her business card. You can now get rid of Brenda by calling her and saying, There's a breaking news story somewhere in River Heights. 
This is so ridiculous, it's funny. Brenda gets an anonymous message that there's news going on in the north, and she instantly runs away to look for it. How does she expect to find the news story without more information? How long does she wander around in the north before realizing the call was fake? Why does she never take her cameraman with her? And why doesn't she lock her van when she leaves? Whatever, it's just an excuse to get rid of her. You go in Brenda's news van and get a fingerprint from her microphone. When Nancy runs the prints through the computer, she learns Brenda touched the note the culprit left for Nancy. That's the most compelling evidence Nancy and her friends collect. It's definitive proof that Brenda is guilty, but the game treats it like normal, non-crucial evidence. Around this time, Nancy asks Ned to distract Deirdre by taking her out on a date. He already did that, though. It is kind of weird Ned has to ask Deirdre out twice. He totally could have snooped through her notebook at the same time when he fingerprinted her drink. Well, this time with the distracting date, Ned and Deirdre leave together, so Bess or George have to look in Deirdre's notebook. Inside are a bunch of silly notes with doodles. Just like Sonny June's notes, I wonder if he knows Deirdre. There's also a red light ticket. Nancy looks up the ticket number on the police computer. There's a picture of Deirdre singing. It looks like someone drew the picture by hand instead of using her normal model. Maybe they couldn't get her singing face to look right? The last big puzzle to prove Nancy's innocence is the gas chromatograph puzzle. The report in the evidence locker says the police are suspicious of Nancy because she had gasoline on her clothes when she was arrested, and gasoline can be used to start fires. Are those the same clothes Nancy was wearing at the time of the fire, though? It's possible she never changed her clothes after that. It's gross, but possible. Nancy asks her friends to get a gas sample from the fire. You have to get the free glass tube from Alexi's shop. Use it on the thermostat in the old town hall. Nancy uses the tube on the machine in the forensics room. The machine says there's a lot of accelerant number 45. Whatever that is. I wonder why the police don't keep a chart next to the machine. The analysis machine in game 6 told you outright what the scarlet hand was made of. I guess this machine is less high-tech. Nancy calls her dad and asks for help. He says that he'll send you a paper about accelerants. It shows up on the fireplace mantle at the Drew house, which is a weird drop-off location. Why doesn't he send it directly to the jail? The paper does not show up until you found everyone's accelerants. I like to find everyone's accelerants at the same time I get their fingerprints. It's more efficient that way. Tony's accelerant is paint thinner that's in her back room with her filing cabinet. Brenda's accelerant is nail polish, which is in the makeup kit in her van. Deirdre's accelerant is... Wait, she doesn't have an accelerant. I wonder why she's not part of this puzzle. Alexei's accelerant is the hardest to find. To get it, you have to win the number punch game in Alexei's shop. The numbers 1 through 41 are randomly scattered throughout the board. You have to find all the numbers and click on them in the correct order. This is a fun little challenge, and the game is nice enough to automatically let you win if you fail three times in a row. When you get the high score, you get a key to Alexei's trunk. You can't look at the trunk if Alexei's there. Distract him by asking him to find an item. It's odd that Alexei keeps falling for this trick, You'd think he would catch on to the fact that Nancy's friends aren't here to buy anything. Next to Alexi's trunk are the keys to the fire alarm. That's evidence. Inside Alexi's trunk is a bottle of ether. That's the accelerant. There's a newspaper about him being found guilty and his detective notebook. It's sad how his notebook goes from youthful idealism to elderly despair. Give the paper on accelerants to Nancy, she compares it to the gas chromatograph results. This shows the correct accelerant is isopropyl alcohol. This is the one piece of evidence that you put in Nancy's square of the police evidence board. Tony has five pieces of evidence, all the other characters have three pieces. Sorting all the evidence is a solid puzzle that I enjoy. When you've done it correctly, Chief McGinnis is impressed. Nancy can now leave jail. Hooray! 
Nancy runs into Ned's loving arms. Just kidding. At this point, Ned disappears from the game. We never learn where he went or why. What happened to Ned? While Ned may be gone, George is not. She appears in person in Nancy's living room. I wonder why she isn't an in-person character for the whole game like Bess is. I like George, but something about her model in this game looks off to me. I think it's how there's a black outline on the outside edges of her arms. You play as Nancy for the final quarter of the game. It's interesting to see Nancy interact with the various characters, especially Alexi, who is nothing but nice to Nancy. It's like he's a completely different person. Alexi confesses he went inside the burning building to get the time capsule, but he was unsuccessful. Tony lies to Nancy, pretending she supported Nancy the whole time. Brenda tries to trick Nancy into giving an interview. Deirdre's the funniest. She complains about Bess spying on her all day long. Deirdre says she's not trying to steal Ned away from Nancy. She just likes hanging out with Ned because all the other boys she knows are idiots. That may be true, but if George or Bess calls Ned, he complains Deirdre insulted him nonstop during their date. That sounds accurate. To progress with the game, Nancy needs to search Brenda's van. There are about five things in the van that Nancy's friends overlooked when they searched it earlier. I guess Nancy's better at finding clues than them. Near Brenda's microphone is the isopropyl alcohol, the accelerant the culprit used. Sadly, Nancy can't go to the police with this evidence. If you go to Chief McGinnis, he gets mad at you for bothering him. No wonder Nancy does all the police work in this town. The real police aren't even trying. Brenda's van has a video of her interviewing Bess. When did this interview happen? Bess has been at Scoop all day long. Nancy notices Deirdre's in the background. You have to move all ten sliders to the correct spots so you can hear what Deirdre says. This is not a fun puzzle. I don't know how you solve it without guessing. It'd be easier if you had to do each slider separately, but no. The top slider and the bottom slider of each column both have to be correct for your answer to be accepted. It's easily the worst puzzle of the game. When you solve the puzzle, Nancy hears Deirdre's phone call with an unknown person. Who was she calling? Annoyingly, Deirdre plays the pronoun game, so we don't know for sure what she's talking about. That is, Deirdre says, she's looking for it, because she came through here. Nancy's big takeaway is that Deirdre was following someone in disguise as Nancy. If you go to Town Hall, you find Brenda's press pass there, so presumably Deirdre was following Brenda. That matches with some earlier dialogue about Brenda disguising herself as Nancy, but who cares? We don't follow up on it! Instead, watching the video lets Nancy ask Deirdre about the notes that were left for her. Deirdre confesses she intercepted a note the culprit left for Nancy, then she secretly followed Nancy. I am frustrated now. Because we already know this information. Deirdre told Ned about it earlier. She showed him the note and it started the big fingerprinting challenge. So players are forced to do the annoying video slider puzzle just to learn information they already know. Brenda's van also has a clipboard detailing her impossibly busy schedule. Bess and Deirdre both confirm Brenda cannot possibly make all of her appointments on time without running into major traffic. After this, Alexi and Tony can tell Nancy the town has an underground tunnel system. Alexi encourages Nancy to read his book about it, cover to cover. Hidden inside the cover are instructions for the final puzzle of the game. There's also a note saying the entrance to the tunnels is under Brenda's van. You can only take the tunnels to Town Hall. The other five tunnels are blocked. That's a shame. I was hoping to have my own personal tunnel to Pancake City. The most important thing in Brenda's van is a letter. You take the key from Brenda's clipboard and open the safe. It has a rejection letter. Brenda's big national news story about an antiquities theft was cancelled when Nancy solved the mystery first. 
That's a pretty strong motive for Brenda. This letter pairs with a newspaper about the antiquities case on the second floor of Nancy's house, hidden in the bookshelf where it's really easy to overlook. You have to read the newspaper in order to beat the game. That is a point against this game's favor, because it is very easy to miss the newspaper and get badly stuck. It's the number one thing people most get stuck on. Probably because there's nothing to indicate this particular newspaper is important. It honestly isn't important. It doesn't really tell players anything new or necessary about the Antiquities case. About every six months, I get a message from somebody who's really stuck on the game, and the solution is always... You're stuck on the newspaper thing. After this, Nancy can confront Brenda. Brenda openly admits she's the culprit. She lured Nancy into town hall with a fake note, and she didn't much care if Nancy lived or died. Brenda brags she's going on the air soon with a broadcast so damaging, no one in town will trust Nancy ever again. Game 20 also had a culprit with a big personal vendetta against Nancy, but I think it's done better here. Dwayne mostly cared about finding a treasure, while Brenda's main concern is revenge. It's a change of pace to have such an early culprit reveal in this game. Normally, you figure out who the culprit is at the very end. Here, we learn who the culprit is, and the game keeps going for a decent amount of time. The downside is that, in order for the story to continue, Nancy can't get help from the police or anyone else. Not that I expected Deirdre to do anything useful, besides for maybe throwing ice cream at Brenda, but I did expect more out of Alexi. All he does is offer encouragement. Tony shows off her true colors, as she seems to take pleasure in refusing to help. She dislikes Nancy that much. The end of the game says Tony stopped running for city council, Tony is so mean here, I feel like she deserves a worse punishment. As for Bess, she disappears from the game without any notice, which is just like Ned! Why do Nancy's friends keep leaving her in her hour of need? George is the one who can help. She says she's got something to stop Brenda's broadcast, but it needs a battery. You have to go to Nancy's desk to grab one. This is such a brief, simple task, I always felt like it was just an excuse for Nancy to leave and re-enter the room. That way they can have the scene where a rock is thrown through the window. Taped to the rock is a note saying, Arsonists will get a taste of their own medicine. Nancy asks, who would do this? And I agree, I want to know who attacked Nancy's house. In the ending, Nancy says her neighbors fixed the window and people gave her treats. That's nice, but I don't think a sorry we tried to send you to jail for life gift basket is enough to make up for the vandalism, distrust, and slander. If the people of River Heights hate Nancy so much, then it's no wonder Nancy's always leaving town on vacation. There's a brief moment where Nancy puts the battery on the table and George says, You got the right one! This always felt a touch out of place to me. It feels like a scene from a puzzle where somebody checks if you got the right object, like when Big Island Mike checks your shave ice, or Shorty checks your vegetables. In this case, it's not a puzzle. Nancy gets the correct battery every time. So why make a minor deal out of checking what battery you got when you can't get the wrong one? So both finding the battery and delivering the battery feel a little weird to me. I don't know why. George says she's got a jammer, which is a circuit board puzzle. Nancy has to click on the wires and lights to rotate them. You want to turn on all the lights by connecting them to the battery wire. I like this puzzle. I think it's good, and I'm glad they brought it back in game 27. George says you need to attach the jammer to the antenna box in Brenda's van. This will block Brenda's broadcast for a half hour. Now that I think about it, Nancy is lucky that Brenda's doing a live broadcast from the town hall. This jammer plan probably wouldn't have worked if Brenda was at the Heights 9 News TV studio. Connecting the jammer is another good puzzle. You want to connect the five wires without any of them overlapping. I have seen this and the circuit board puzzle in dozens of other games. They are classic video game puzzles. When you solve the puzzle, a key falls down by Nancy's head. 
Just like when she first did Snack Shop and Warnings at Waverly Academy. Why do people keep throwing keys at Nancy's head? It's the key to open one of the doors in the underground tunnels. Open the correct door to find Brenda's secret lair. It has her detailed notes which explain how she perfectly timed the fire to occur six minutes after Nancy entered Town Hall. I like how Brenda has a dartboard with Nancy's picture on it in the corner, that's kind of cute. I'm a little disappointed there are lots of things here that we can't look at. There's a bunch of papers on the table, a box of files, and what appears to be a gym bag with shoes. I wanted to go through all of these things. Conveniently for Nancy, Brenda put all the important evidence together in an easy-to-carry bag. It has a snowflake tray, the isopropyl alcohol, the book of matches, and what looks like a wig. Brenda's hair looked so perfect at the start of the game, I can't believe she was wearing a wig only moments before. Brenda enters the room. This feels like a typical end-of-game culprit revelation scene for the series. We're at a new location, there's a full-body shot of the culprit, and Nancy asks her usual questions. How did you do it? Why did you do it? So, we've seen that, like, at least a dozen times in other games. The scene still works, even if it's not a surprise to learn Brenda's guilty. I guess the game could have tried to work in a surprise culprit here, but that would have felt a little convoluted. Brenda throws the jammer aside and grabs a tape, saying it's the final nail in Nancy's coffin. I don't understand why there's a tape. The whole point of doing a live broadcast is that it's not taped ahead of time, more complaints about that later. Brenda somehow locks Nancy in the room, despite not having a key in her hand. Nancy needs to escape the tunnels before the timer at the top of the screen runs out. Take the screwdriver from one corner of the room. Another corner has piles of cardboard boxes. Move them aside to find the exit door. Use the screwdriver on the door to take it off its hinges. Nancy walks into a maze. Follow Alexi's instructions to get through it. This puzzle is a little tough, I usually just look up the solution instead of trying to solve it on my own. There are 15 steps you have to take, the majority of them are go straight forward through the door without turning. The maze ends at a ladder. Nancy climbs up it, and as a special bonus for solving the case, she finds the Clues Challenge Medallion. Alright! The ladder leads to the police station. Nancy goes inside and gives the evidence bag to Chief McGinnis. Both Nancy and the Chief are shown in silhouette here. It's the same silhouette used in the Nancy Drew logo, which is a nice touch. The next scene is Brenda Carlton doing her live broadcast. Chief McGinnis interrupts and arrests her. He puts handcuffs on her, although if you pause the game, you can see there are no handcuffs. Brenda's just holding her hands behind her back, like she's been cuffed. Brenda loudly protests as she tries running away, then she falls flat on her face. The chief finishes by saying, Back to you, Jim. I think it's a nice, light-hearted scene to end on, but whenever I play the game, people complain the news ticker says, Reporter arrested on live TV. Before Brenda's arrested! That's impossible if it's truly live TV. My guess is that it's the live TV footage, which was replayed on the news later that week. Heights 9 News probably replayed that clip a lot. Nancy's ending letter says Brenda's now working as a weather reporter at the local jail. Deirdre invites Ned to a clues challenge party, and the time capsule proves Alexi is innocent. At long last! There's a picture of him smiling in front of his door. He says he'd be willing to help Nancy in a future case. It's sad that never happened. Alexi's a cool character. I would love to solve a mystery with him. Nancy picks something new to put in the time capsule. She says you can figure out what it is yourself. But maybe she's a little overconfident in our detective skills, because fans still disagree on what she picked. I think it was a pancake from Pancake City. That's the end of the game. I enjoy the game and think it's very good. Some people don't like playing as Nancy's friends instead of Nancy, but I really liked that aspect. 
The characters and story are great, and the puzzles are good, besides that video slider puzzle. I'd like to give it a perfect score, but I do have to take away a point for the part where you get completely stuck unless you read one newspaper. That's happened to me more than once. It feels like a game-breaking bug that didn't get caught during testing. And also, it would be nice if you could switch directly between Nancy's friends and they shared an inventory. On a sad note, this is the unofficial end of the Nancy Drew series. Whenever I marathon the Nancy Drew games, half of the viewers leave after game 25, and they do not come back. I'm not entirely sure why people dislike the games after this one. So for many people, this is the end of the series. I'd say, if that's true, the series ends on a high note. I give Nancy Drew number 25, Alibi in Ashes, a 9 out of 10.